Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the fourth birthday of Family Life Church. Amen. Yeah, I think that's worth celebrating, man. Well, cool. So to start off with, I want to do an interactive little poll. So I'm going to ask if everyone could stand back up. I know we just sat down from worship. It'll be all right. We'll survive. <laughs> all right, so this is what we're going to do. It is I'm going to see who has been here the longest, but we're going to start with the most recent. So let's do this. If you started coming to Family Life Church in 20, 2020, a.k.a. in the last couple weeks, just go ahead and have a seat for us. All right, cool. That's fine. That's good. All right. So now let's get to this one. You ready? If you started coming to Family Life Church in 2019, go ahead and have a seat. All right, cool, man. I love that. It shows the growth that we've had since 2019. That's incredible. I love it. Now let's keep moving. If you started coming to Family Life Church in 2018, go ahead and have a seat. Some of you guys are starting to think, wait a minute, when did I start coming to church? It's like, man, it's too early for this, right? I haven't had lunch yet. All right. And let's go ahead and just let's just go all the way to the beginning. If, unless you started coming to Family Life Church when we first launched or in that like first month after we launched, go ahead and have a seat. So the only people who should be standing up right now are the people who were here when we launched in 2016. Let's hear. Oh, come on, y'all. Can we give some love to our OGs in the room? Man, you guys go ahead and have a seat, man. Man, we want to thank you guys for being here for all four years through the ups and downs and all the in-betweens. But today, man, we're going to have some fun today. My name is David. I'm the executive pastor here at Family Life Church. Man, we're going to have some fun, like I said. And I, I'm feeling kind of generous today. And what I want to do is I want to give away a couple of these 4 Ocala magnets. How many people have seen this? You raise your hand. How many people have seen this, like, driving around town? Yeah, so a lot of us have seen these. Um, and, you know, usually what we do is we give these out to people once they've joined the Dream Team. This is kind of part of the, hey, welcome to the team kind of thing. But I want to do this, but I want to go ahead and give away two of these. Now, if I give this to you, here's the promise that you have to make. You have to promise to keep it on your car, okay? You can't just, like, take it and, like, throw it away when we get out of church. That's not cool, man. So, but uh, raise your hand if you like one of these. You want one? Yeah, come on. Let's give a round of applause right here. All right. And I got one more, one more. Man, this is hard, man. I'm going to give it back there in the back. Come on down here. Let's give her a round of applause also. I thought about making a joke about not being able to see you with that camo, but I think that'd probably go over the head of a few people. Yeah, you got the orange there so we can see you. I love it. Well, cool, man. But as the church, we have that slogan, for Ocala. You know, when you drove in on the property, you probably saw that, for Ocala. If you've been driving around, you've seen the magnets, for Ocala. But to be honest, I think that some of us would probably not really know what that means, Right? I mean, if you saw that bumper sticker or, or that magnet before you ever came to church, before you became a part, you may think to yourself, what are these magnets? What, what are they trying to say for Ocala? And this morning, we're going to help you understand the heart behind this for Ocala. And to do that, what I want to start off with is by showing you a few different organizations so you guys can think about what does it mean to be for something. Let's go ahead and put our first one up there. PETA. People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, right? Like, we all know what PETA is for. PETA is for animals' rights, right? Or how about this organization? The NRA, National Rifle Association. What are they for? Of course, obviously, they're for protecting Second Amendment rights. But we got one more. Let's see what this last one is. St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. Finding Cures, Saving Children. Chris, when you see this, maybe your mind goes to those commercials that we see on the TV, and you got, like, the sick kids, and, and they're offering treatment for these kids. And maybe when you see this, your heart kind of just melts a little bit. You're thinking, oh, those children. You know, you just, your heart goes out to them, right? Well, what I want to do is I want to go back through these organizations again because we talked about what they're for, but let's look at something deeper than that. Let's look at perception, shall we? For the example, for the PETA. Now, when this image goes up here, there's going to be two different types of people. There's going to be the one type of person that says, yeah, protect the animals. Fish are pets too, right? <laughs> but then you have the other side that says, PETA, man, them people are crazy. <laughs> of course, and then you got the third type, I should say, which are kind of the rednecks. When they see PETA, they think it stands for people eating tasty animals, right? 
<laughs> but there's two different perspectives on the same organization. How about this next one, NRA? Same thing, very divisive, right? You have one side that says, yeah, you go for it. Protect our rights. Ain't no one taking our guns. But then you have the other side that's like, wow, you're, help, you're allowing people to get killed, right? There's two different perspectives on the same organization. But with St. Jude's, St. Jude's, hopefully no one in here is thinking, that evil organization be helping sick kids. I mean, if that is you this morning, we're going to help you know Jesus today. Come on. But no, everyone loves St. Jude's because we know what they're for. Now, I want to show you one other organization, and I want you to think about what is it that they are known for. And that last one is the church. Now, we're not talking about Family Life Church. We're talking about the big C church, the church of Jesus Christ, all the churches. And if you were to go around and ask everybody, you get a whole bunch of different perspectives, right? Maybe you share the perspective like my neighbor. When he thinks of the church, he thinks of scandals. He thinks of pastors who have you know, messed up sexually, right? Or priests who have slipped up and hurt so many different people. Some people think that when they think of the church. What is the church for? Corruption. They're hypocrites. You know, or maybe people, when you say that you go to church, they think of the church as that place where they're just against everything. You know, if we're going to protest everything, right? You know, we're anti-progress pretty much is what they think. Now, this is Westboro Baptist Church, which, by the way, if you don't know, Westboro Baptist Church is pretty much just an extended family. It's not like an actual like, kind of church like we think of a church. But that's the picture that people think of when they think of churches. Or maybe they think of churches as being full of hate, like 10 years ago, this happened near Gainesville, that had the Bernard Quran Day. Those Christians are just so full of hate. Of course, let's not forget the biggest and, you know, the big elephant out there that people think, which is that churches, all they want is your money, <laughs> right? We've got to buy the pastor a big old mansion in a gated neighborhood. Hey, that'd be nice. Hey, you know, but hey, next time, next time someone says, all churches want is your money, all you have to tell them is, really? Because the last time I went to church, they weren't selling Disney, you know, Mickey Mouse lollipops for $8 a pop. Come on now. Man, we should start doing that, man. We could get some mission trips going on, get them funded in like two weeks. Man, they're doing something right down there in Orlando. <laughs> but what is the church for? More or less, what should the church be known for? And here's the truth that we all need to understand, is that everything we do, everything we say, and everything we react to paints a picture of who Jesus is to the world. If you agree, say yes. Now, some of you guys may be thinking, oh, no. well, pro I probably shouldn't have said that thing I said this week to that person, right? You know, maybe I shouldn't have told that person they were number one when we were driving down the road and they cut me off. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have said that on Facebook. That was a little snarky. And I think when we read this, I think it's very easy for us to think, man, I need to get my stuff together because I'm painting a bad picture of Jesus. I think it's easy for us to instantly go to the negative when we think about this. But let's flip this and think about it a different way, if you would, with me. What, what if we were to read it like this? Everything kind that we do, every uplifting thing that we say, and every time we react patiently, we paint a picture of Jesus to the world that is positive. Now, does that sound like something you guys want to do this morning? Come on. We can do that. Now, why is it important that we do this? Now, why can't we just go off to our own thing and let people think what they want to think? Who cares? It's them, not me. Why is it important that we do this? Well, let me give you some statistics. In Marion County, the place that we all call home, hopefully, in the year 2000, the population was 258,000 people. Now, raise your hand for me real quick if you were here before the year 2000. How many people lived here before the year 2000? Take a look around. That's not a lot of people. Now, how many people moved here since 2000? Yes, look at that. There's more people who moved here since the year 2000 than lived here before. And we see it in the year 2019. The population has grown all the way to 358,000 people. That's huge, y'all. We live in a booming community. But that's not what I want to highlight. This is what I want to highlight. 
in our community, a study was found, done and found that two-thirds of every single person in this, in this Marion County say they do not follow religion. That leaves 240,000 people who do not know Christ. That's not a small number, is it? I mean, that's huge. I mean, you could fill up all the churches in Marion County probably four or five times, and still you'd have people who couldn't fit in. There's people that go to the same workplace as us that need Christ. There's people who shop at the same Publix as us that needs Christ. There's people who live on the same street as us that needs the love of Christ. There's kids who go to the same school as your kids that needs that love of Christ. And who paints the picture of who Jesus is? We all point to ourselves, right? And say, that's me. Collectively, we paint a picture of who Jesus is. We need to make sure that we paint a picture that is accurate. So this morning, what I want us to do is we go ahead and transition into the truth of God's word. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 John chapter 4. What I want us to do is look at what is it that the church should be known for. What is the picture that people should see of the church when they think of the church? And in this book that we're going to be reading out of, this was actually a letter that the Apostle John, who is one of Jesus' closest disciples, is part of the inner three. Of, um, and in this book, what John does is he addresses a question that was going around the early church. And what was going on is that people in the early church, they were starting to question whether or not people were actually saved. I mean, we, we go through that today, don't we? We come, sometimes wonder, like, am I really saved? Or, you know, did that prayer really work? Like, you know, we, we think that that, Right. And so he writes this letter to the early church to address that single question. Pretty much, what does it look like to be a Christ follower? And so in 1 John chapter 4, we're going to pick up and we're going to see the words that John writes to the early, early church. And these words are just as true for us today as it was for those people back then. Let's see what John writes. He starts off, he says, My beloved friends, let us continue to love each other since love comes from who? From God. He says, everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. The person who refuses to love, though, doesn't know the first thing about God. Somebody say this with me, because God is love. So you can't know him if you don't love. Now, there's some people, when they think of God, what do they think about? I mean, you guys probably know this, right? When people think about God, they think about that policeman up in the sky, you know, he's watching your every single move. He's waiting for you to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. And as soon as you do, kaposh, right? He's ready to just unleash his wrath on you. Like people have that view of God. Now, I don't think it's as strong today as it was maybe 50 or 60 years ago, but that view is still around. And think about it, there's 240,000 people who don't know God. We're talking about know God in the intimate sense. And some people may have that view of God. But what we see here is God is love. Maybe we need to help paint a different picture of who God is so people can know the real God. Let's continue. So John continues and he writes, this is how God showed his love for us. Come on, somebody say, that's me. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. This is beautiful, y'all. This is the kind of love we're talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loved me, he loved us, and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away our sins and the damage they've done to our relationship with God. Y'all, that's, that's the crux of Christianity right there. That's what it's about. It's that God loved us, so he sent his son down to earth to die for our sins. Other translations, they use this um, phrase, it goes like this. Before God, excuse me, before we loved God, he loved us first. Isn't that beautiful to think about? Before you even knew of God, before anyone ever preached at you, before you even thought of, God was thinking about you. Doesn't that kind of paint a positive picture of God? I love that picture of God, right? We all love it because we see a good heavenly father who is thinking of us. Let's continue. John's going to get into some application here. So we looked at some truth, right? That God is love. Those who are born of God should love. But let's go ahead 
and see what happens here. Here's the application. John writes, my dear, dear friends. So he really wants you to pay attention now because you're dear, dear friends. It says, if God loved us like this, then we certainly ought to love one another. No one has seen God ever, but if we love one another, God dwells deeply within us and his love becomes complete in us. What do we call that? We call that perfect love. That's the application. What should we be known for? Our love. But John doesn't stop there. So he he tells us what is God. You know, he gives us some truth about God. He tells us, all right, now this is what you need to be doing. But he also gives a little bit of a rebuke here that I think is important for us to know too. Later on in the chapter, John writes, if anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, a.k.a. we get on Facebook, we talk behind people's back, or a.k.a. we go around and we're trying to get, take advantage of other people so we can get what we want. If anyone goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of it, that makes him a liar. Continues, and he goes on, he says, if that person won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God that he can't see? The command we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. Come on, somebody say that with me. Loving God includes loving people. Come on, somebody tap someone next to you and tell them, loving God includes loving people. You got to love both. I mean, there's people out there that think, hey, as long as I got my relationship with God intact, I'm good, right? You know, I'll follow the Ten Commandments. You know, I won't go off and do other stuff. You know, as long as I just keep to myself, I'm good. I got my relationship with Jesus settled. We're good. My ticket to heaven is punched. Hallelujah. I'm waiting for them gates to open up. But what does John tell us? He says, if you want to be at peace with God, what do you have to do? You have to be at peace with others. Sometimes we concentrate on that vertical relationship, but John tells us if you're going to concentrate on that vertical relationship, you have to look at the people around you. Now, come on, somebody help me. What shape is this right here? That's a cross. That's grace. That's love. That's what Jesus came to do. That's what our lives should be remarked by. Or as they have it in your notes, the church is to be characterized by love for God by loving people. We'll put it like this. We are for Ocala. Why? Because God is for Ocala. God wants to show his love towards people, but he gives each and every single one of us, his followers, the responsibility and the honor and the privilege to be his hands and feet to show that love. If you agree, say yes. Yes. We are for Ocala because God is for Ocala. Which then begs the question of, well, how can we be for Ocala? Right? You know, how do we do this? Are we going to just go go around, carry a cross around, and hope people talk to us? You know, are we going to go feed just food to everyone? Like, how do we show that we're for Ocala? This morning, what I want us to do is I want us to transition from the truth now, and I want us to look at some applications so we can start living this stuff out at home. So simply today for the application is how to be for Ocala. And the simple application today is just to find the middle ground. Now, when I say that, some of you guys are like, what? Come on, man. I don't know what that means. Find the middle ground. Now, I'm going to show you how this works because once you understand, it's going to be absolutely a game changer in your ability to be able to show God's love for people, okay? So let's look at this. Okay, so I want you to think about all 348,000 people in Marion County. Would you all agree that the people in Marion County have many different belief systems, right? I mean, the people in Marion County, they view things totally different than other people, right? I mean, let let, let me show it to you like this. So you have a lot of people in Marion County, right, who are Democrats, right? And then you have on the other spectrum, you have a lot of people in Marion County who are Republicans. I mean, we have a spectrum in political beliefs and viewpoints, right? Or how about this? You know, we think about Marion County, we have a lot of people who have, you know, religious beliefs and they're all totally bought in. But then you also have a lot of people who think religion is a sham. You have a lot of people who are Florida State fans 
and you have a lot of people who are Gator fans. Where's all my Gator fans at? And then you have the middle ground, which is UCF. Come on. <laughs> Let's not forget the most serious of them all, though. We have a lot of people who think Chick-fil-A has the best chicken sandwich. And there's a lot of people who also think Popeye's has the best chicken sandwich. <laughs> At least with Chick-fil-A, you can get in and out in five minutes, right? <laughs> but people in Marion County, they're going to differ on their views of things. And we all know what happens. We were, most of us are on social media. What happens? We have this person totally disagrees with that other person, and they're at each other's necks. And I've read some research on this and what has happened, and social media has been a big part of this, but what has happened is that people have become more polarized, and what they do is they get into their different tribes. You know, we're Bernie Sanders supporters, and we're Trump supporters, and we're Biden supporters, and we're not going to talk to each other. You know, I, I think this way, and you think that way, and we can't get along. You know, you have a belief in God, and you don't, and we can't talk because that's too controversial. I'm going to get triggered. Studies show this. I mean, it used to be people would have conversations all the time. People would intermingle. And studies show that we're more polarized in our country than we've ever been since they've been keeping track. But as the church, we know that Jesus is for every single person. He's not just for the Republicans, y'all. He's not just for the Democrats. He's not just for the people who have faith. He's not just for the atheists. God is for all people. Agree? Say yes. So then we have a responsibility to reach all people. It's our responsibility to paint that picture of who God really is. And that's why we look for the middle ground. Because it doesn't matter what your belief system is or your ideology there's a middle ground that we can all agree on. A Trump supporter and a Biden supporter would both agree that we want safe streets, don't we? They would both agree that we want our schools to excel. They would all agree that we want our economy to be strong. Of course, let's not forget what brings us together the strongest is the belief that we want State Road 200 to have less traffic. Come on, somebody. But there's a middle ground where we can come to the middle and get to know other people. Now here at the church, we love looking for these middle grounds. And a lot of these middle grounds I've been talking about is what I would consider external middle grounds. Good schools, safe neighborhoods, good economy. Those are external middle grounds. You know, as the church, we love to go to the school next door and the Mary Oaks Elementary School and be involved in those schools because that's a thing that people care about. Our community, we care about good schools. You know, I think about also with the blood drive. We do like two blood drives a year. And, you know, that's a middle ground. Everyone would agree blood drives are good. Like, no one's going to be like, don't you give your blood away, you know. <laughs> and I think about a strong economy. That's why today, you know, we have Sabora's Latinos outside. That's a new local restaurant owned by local people. God's for the businesses because those businesses employ people. So as a church, I think we can show that we're for the businesses in this community which is why we have them out there. And today, by the way, just as a, just as a little insert, um, if you're interested in buying a meal, it's $8 a plate. I've had it. Delicious. Julian's a great guy. He actually helped us start this church in 2016. So make sure if you have some cash with you, go buy a plate before you leave. Even if you don't like it, just go ahead and buy it to support a local business. Then you don't have to go back, right? No, but it's going to be delicious food. Julian's an amazing cook. I've been to his restaurant personally. Amazing food. But let's go support Julian and, and his local business here in Ocala. Because God is for Ocala. Does it make sense? God is for Ocala, so we are for Ocala. But these are external. These are external middle grounds I've been talking about. But there's a level that's deeper than just the surface external. And this is where it gets good. And that's what I call the internal middle grounds. The internal middle grounds is where we get to build relationships with people so we can have the conversations about faith. Because, yes, everyone needs safe streets, but people on the inside need stuff too, don't they? People in our community, they need to know that there's someone who loves them and that they can trust. You know, people want to have that friend that they can count on. You know, someone they can just play video games with. Someone who would invite them to go to Hammer and Stain with them. You know, that place over on 60th that makes those really cute crafts, but it empties your wallet out for you also. 
But people want that. These are internal middle grounds. And the cool part is when you bring the external with the internal, you get an opportunity to paint that picture of who Jesus is. Now let me show you how this works. So like I said, I'm a big UCF guy, right? I mean, I'm a 2013 alumni, love them, 2017 undefeated national champs. Very controversial statement I just said in the sports circles. But anyways, I love UCF. And because of my love for UCF, I got involved with the UCF Alumni Club here in Marion County, which, by the way, there's about 3,000 UCF alumni in the county. And so we get together, we watch football games, and we watch UCF just pound the other teams in. Not in 2015 when we went winless, but now we pound them pretty good. <laughs> but that's a middle ground, right? Because you have people from all sorts of different ideologies, they come together to go watch UCF win football games. And... This year, football season's over now. It's like another like 200-something days till college football starts, so it's a time of depression for a lot of us guys. But this past football season, my wife and I, we had a great opportunity to meet this young lady who graduated from UCF just a couple years ago and moved back to Ocala. And we got a chance to meet, and, and, and we got, had a chance just to have a conversation with her, got to find out what is her story. You know, ends up that she went to the same high school I did just a couple years removed, and, and we even have some mutual friends in common. It's it really cool, you know, getting a chance to meet her. And, and my wife and I, we just kept loving on her, kept loving on her. And, um, and we got to a point where we found out also that she has a girlfriend. Um, she came out in college. And, but, you know, we're just like, you know what, we're just going to keep showing the love of Jesus. And, and we just kept loving on her. And, and you know how you get to, like, different phases in your friendship levels? Like, you know, at, at first you just kind of start off with the head nod, like, what's up? <laughs> and then you kind of get to, like, the pound and, and then, like, the side hug. And, and then you get to the place where you're just like, come here, you. I'm going to give you a big old bear hug, right? I mean, that's when you know you're close to somebody. Because I ain't going to somebody on the streets and just giving them a bear hug and getting a face pound, right? You know, like... There's a different levels of friendship, and, and my wife and I, we got to the level with this girl. Where we, I mean, we see her in the store. We're like, hey, come here, man. Don't you run off from me. I'm going to give you my bear hug, right? But we're to that place in our relationship. And I had an opportunity at one of the games to share with her that I'm a pastor. And I didn't know what she was going to do. You know, obviously, with her lifestyle, you know, it doesn't really stack up with Scripture, and she, I didn't really know how she was going to react to that, and but she opened up, and she shared with me about how she grew up in church, and she liked it. But when she came home from college, after she had come out, she said that the church she grew up in rejected her, told her she couldn't come back, and said some nasty stuff to her. Now, like I said, I'm not one of those that's going to be like, yeah, that's fine, go ahead, live that. But same time, I think we treat people with the love of God no matter what. And that young lady, she opened up. And I got to share some hope and some love with her. And hopefully made an impact that helped her view God differently. Now, if I would have went up to her at that watch party and just started off with, hey, my name's Pastor David Hill. I have a new church over in southwest side of Ocala. Are you saved? Like, she would never have opened up with me, right? Like, she would have turned around and walked away. How do I know that? Because I've seen the studies. Like, 91% of people say they don't want to be friends with the pastor. I was like, I know better than do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I found that middle ground externally and then we found the middle ground internally and I was able to have an opportunity to talk with her about something she probably doesn't talk to a lot of people about especially not pastors but there's also a wrong way to do this when I was in college I worked at Chick-fil-A God's Holy Chicken and there was this guy that got a job there while I was working and, and he's one of these guys in his church that he went to it was like out in, like not, it was kind of outskirts of town. And, and what they would do is they would give their members these tracks, which are like little pamphlets. And, and the ones that his church gave him, you know, there's some great tracks out there, but the one that his church would give to their members to hand out were the ones that were like, listen, you're, if you were to die today, you're going to go to hell. So you need to accept Christ right now so you can be in heaven with Jesus and also come to our church, right? <laughs> you know, it was like one of those. And what he would do is he would like hide them all over the, diff, you know, all over the kitchen and stuff. Like you'd go and you'd like lift up a box and there'd be like one underneath the box. It's like, oh, what's this? Ah, oh, it's him again. You know, <laughs> he'd leave him in the bathroom and stuff like that. Um, but even worse, he would literally go to people and tell them they're going to hell. It's like, really? Like he literally came to me. He's like, hey, David, you're going to hell. 
I'm like, really? Like, are you sure about that? Like, like why? He's like, because you go to the wrong church. Oh, man, I didn't know Jesus visited your church and told you guys you were the only ones going to heaven. Like, but he'd literally go around and tell people that. And then he would invite them to church. What do you think people said when he invited them? That's right, big in. Oh, I ain't going with you anywhere. Now, I'm sure if you were to ask him, he would probably say, well, I'm just being persecuted for my faith. Are you sure? Pretty sure you're being rejected because you're a jerk, right? Like, there's a right way and a wrong way to do this. Like John says, you know, John says that the command of Jesus is blunt. We love God by loving others. You can't just love God without loving other people around you. Our God is love. It's up to us to paint that picture. How can we show our community that God is for Ocala? It's by us, God's followers, to show that we are for Ocala. And when people see that we are for Ocala, then they will know that God is for Ocala. Does it make sense? Say yes. Amen. Come on, this is good stuff this morning. Y'all love this. I saw something on Facebook that a friend of mine posted here from the church, and uh, I think this is so good because I think sometimes we think that church is just what happens inside these four walls, right? But check out this post. It says, I believe churches are meant for praising God, but so are 2 a.m. car rides, which I don't know why you're up that late, man. Maybe you got the night shift or something, right? Sh showers and coffee shops, the gym, conversations with friends, strangers, etc. Don't let a building confine your faith because we will never change the world by just going to church. We need to be the church. God has called us to show that he is for Ocala. It's up to us to do that. Now, here at the church, you know, it's about people, right? You know, that's why we're here. It's about people. And one of the things we love to do every year around this time is just kind of show a recap video. And the reason we do this is it's not like a promo video for us, but it's a chance for the people who give here and people who attend here to just kind of see, you know, over the last year, just kind of things we've been able to do. And it's a chance for us to celebrate and just remember you know, the last 365 days. We want to share that with you this morning. Let's play it. We're a church on an average weekend of about 175. But yet our impact has gone so far in such a short time. Imagine what God's going to do in the future as long as we stay united. I've seen him perform so many miracles in my life that it makes me excited to see what he's going to do next. I'm old enough to make my own decision and follow Christ. Because Jesus is my best friend. I can talk to him whenever I'm scared or alone. And I feel like he just loves us so much. And they found uh, that I had lung cancer. They had me all set and prepped and it was, it's just kind of funny. And I'm laying there and laying there and finally the doctor came in and he apologized. And he said, because uh, it looks like it's getting smaller and it's not supposed to do that. And as he told me that, I just felt my tears running down my face. I told him, I said, that's what we've been praying for. I always spend everything. I live paycheck to paycheck. Now, I am, I have paid off my car. I have paid off every other debt that I have except for my house payment. I can see a future. I can see that I can retire. Seek first God's kingdom and what God wants, then all your other needs will be met as well. Putting God first opens sensitivity to God's purpose. And Pastor Hill and his congregation play the elves of Hammond L. Bourne Junior Elementary School. They come in gifting our teachers with resources to help them teach their kids. And the teachers are so very excited because they know that they will be able to do what they need to do in their classrooms. It's a blessing because they can see that the community loves them just as much as the teachers do. We need to make sure that we're making the most out of our time. And here's the truth, is because by visualizing time, it helps you emotionally, mentally, and practically prioritize what matters most.
God has a plan and a calling for your life. I believe he wants to use you to do great things, not just right now, not just in the season, but till the day you die, God wants to use you. You know, our lives should be that light, should be that candle in the dark room that people look to. And here's the cool thing. When people see your light, they know that they need that. And so then God uses us to change people. I'm going to ask if everyone could stand up. This morning we've been talking about what does it mean to be for Ocala. Here we talked about how God is love and God has an immense love for people. But also how God gives us the baton to show his love to the people. Well, this morning what I thought would be just a wonderful way to just end off the sermon this morning is just to bridge the gaps and to stand united as a body to declare that we're going to be for Ocala. Can we do that this morning? So what we're going to do, we're just going to close the gap. So everybody on the edge, just come on, let's bring it to the center. Find someone close to you. Let's uh, grab their hand. We're going to stand united and we're just going to say a prayer of declaration this morning. I believe that God wants to do something through this group of people. We've already seen so many stories of miracles and how people have come to know Christ because of what people have done through this church. But I believe God's not done yet. I believe when we look back on this day four years from now, I believe we're going to be blown away by how many lives have been changed because the people stood up and said, I'm ready to be that change. I'm ready to show that I am for Ocala. Come on, y'all. Let's just pray a prayer of declaration this morning. God, we thank you for your love. God, we thank you for your grace towards us. God, we thank you that we can stand here as a body together, united in mission and in purpose. Not our mission, but your mission and purpose for our lives. So today we stand here and declare that we believe you are a good God. And we are here today to say that we're going to take a stand for what's right. We're going to take a stand for this community. We're going to show your love. We're going to show justice. We're going to show grace. We're going to show intentionality. It's not because of what we can do, but it's because of what your spirit does through us. We're here today to say that we will be for Ocala. And it's only because you are for Ocala. In your precious name we pray. With everyone's eyes still shut, every head still bowed. We have to do this every week. It's too important. You may be here this morning and say, Pastor David, if I were to be honest, I can't really say I have that relationship with God. You may say, you know what, Pastor David, if I were to die today, I can't say I'd be with God in eternity. Well, this morning, I want to give you that invitation to sit, put your faith in Christ. Scripture says that God so loved the world that he gave his son that those who believe in him shall have life and eternal life. So this morning, if you're ready to take that decision, I want to invite you to say this prayer just with a sincere heart. And what I want to do is I want to have all the Christians in the room agree with us also. So I'm going to have everyone just repeat this after me. Just from the depth of your heart, just say, Dear God, I believe that you exist. I believe that you sent Jesus to die for my sins. God, I believe that you raised him from the dead three days later. Today, I admit I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I'm going to live my life to bring you glory. In the precious name of Jesus. Everyone said amen. amen. Come on, y'all. Can we celebrate some people this morning?